Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the Montague Barker Lecture Series. Um, before we start with our speaker, I always like to uh, feature a couple of works that are being put out by Regnum Books. Uh, the first one is Corruption and the Church, Voices from the Global South. And this is... Oh, uh, there we go. Like better? <laughs> okay. And this has been written by Martin Allaby, who's one of our alumni. Uh, here at OCMS, and it talks about how do Christians in the Global South see the relationship between church and corruption. The book summarizes the views of 101 leaders of churches, Christian um, faith-based organizations, and anti-corruption organizations, as told in depth, uh, as told in in-depth interviews with the author, capturing voices from across three continents. This summary and analysis of their views makes for some uncomfortable reading, but suggests some constructive ways forward. The other book I want to uh, point out here is Ecumenical Diaconia of the International Handbook on Ecumenical Diaconia. And the handbook is a valuable resource for students, educators, church workers, and researchers as they grapple with community development challenges and collaborate with others in addressing yeah, well, problems here, here, here. Front, as healthcare, politics, ecology, religion, and economics. Okay. Well, I'm very pleased that our speaker today is Esther Mumbo. She is an associate professor at St. Paul's University in Limuro, Kenya, where she was previously deputy vice chancellor um, of academics. She teaches church history and theologies from women's perspectives. She works closely with the program for Christian and Muslim relations in Africa and is a member of the Circle of Concerned African Women theologians. Her areas of service include networking among Christian and Muslim women leaders on issues of dialogue. She has previously served on the uh, Anglican uh, Doctrinal and Theological Commission. Um, Dr. Mambo uh, earned her uh, BD from um, St. Paul's United Theological College and Phil from Trinity College and oh, PhD from Edinburgh University, excuse me, yes. Um, Esther's title today is The Groaning and the Hope Through the Emmaus Walk, African Women's Envisioning of Mission and Theological Education in the 21st Century and Beyond. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Esther, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, from wherever you are uh, this day. And uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share uh, some thoughts on um, theological education and, and, and mission uh, from the perspectives of, of women. I draw uh, lots of the things I say from both my own uh, work and teaching experience, but also from the circle of concerned African women theologians who have been very, very instrumental in the uh, work of, of, of theology, women, and mission. At the same time, I want to say that I may not envision everything, but uh, it is also part of my own thinking and questioning as I work at the theological college and as I see theological colleges changing from what they were when I was a student and now that I am uh, teaching. I'll read uh, what I put down and then we can engage in the discussions uh, later. This paper that uh, has, have been, has been entitled as Groaning, The Groaning and the Faith uh, Through Eastern Narratives, African Women Envisioning Mission and Theological Education seeks to recapitulate and recast 
the women's aspirations in theological education as individuals and through different conferences and organizations. Some of these conferences I'll mention have been at the level of the World Council of Churches that brings together different uh, churches. And as I teach in an ecumenical space, uh, some of the examples I drew from are from churches uh, that are African or are independent. So the study, uh, the paper will look at uh, the concerns that women raise within the context of Africa. I cannot purport to speak about everyone. And I'm using these two motifs of groaning and hope from the Easter narratives, now that we are still in the Easter season. One of those is the question that the women who go to the grave early in the morning and they ask themselves who will roll the stone away. And the other is the mouse walk when Jesus meets with the two disciples, the, 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 the two men going to the mouse after his resurrection. So first, I want to demonstrate that although the status and role of women in society and in the church is advancing in many contexts and in many ways, women's contributions in theological education and mission is still invisible in many places. It is undervalued and marginalized, especially within the structures of knowledge and power. I want to present ways through which African women have managed to navigate the terrains of mission and theological education in creative ways, uh, asserting a unique participation in the mission of God in the church and the world. And also try to uh, exemplify these creative ways of women as they participate in mission. The aim of every theological education or any theological education is to equip people to preach the good news effectively through word and deed. Any form of education, theological education is crucial for ministry of the church and it has to be contextual, relevant to the realities and needs of the people that it is serving. In some contexts, theological education for ministerial formation and mission has been commercialized so that it is no longer the monopoly of the church, but is offered in public uh, universities or setting and paid for by individual students who then go to seek employment in the church. There are still instances where the church it controls theological education both those that go and study on their own and those that are seconded by the churches, you, there are implications in terms of access to the work that they have to do. While the church has always been a custodian of theological education and mission, one discovers that this way, women have continued to be sidelined and excluded in many traditions. COVID-19 pandemic brought to light some of the challenges of theological education. As Bishop Masinde observed that COVID-19 is not teaching us how to build a house, but what house we have been building all along. The house of theological education was hit hard as classes suddenly shifted to online and some schools which had no infrastructure to cater for online studies, it meant that no studies went on. Those that managed to have online classes struggled with how then you, you teach ministerial uh, uh, formation or how you form without doing practical work. Still studying from home had serious implications for all students, but especially for women who had to juggle between managing the home, classes, childcare, and other responsibilities. 
when we couldn't meet in person for worship, we had to go online. Not every church was able to do this. And even some of the seminaries or theological schools were not able to do this. But COVID-19 was a Kairos moment for us in rethinking theological education, rethinking mission, and rethinking how best we can uh, serve or we can train students. Traditionally, we know that theological education has been a preserve of men. It is true also to say that over the years, women in small numbers have found their ways into theological training. In the missionary and colonial times, I found out that in two spaces, we found two women who found their way into theological study. One was a woman by the name Sarah David, who joined the divinity class of the St. Paul's uh, United Theological College then. And when she joined the class, uh, she was referred to as a Bible woman. The class was only for men and they could not cope with that training. And so she had to be taken away from that class and sent to a wife's class, although herself she was not a married woman because the wife's class was to train wives of the men who are training for the ordained ministry. And from 1903, the first women students were accepted into St. Paul's in 1976, which was many, many years later. And it was by proxy because Mildred Achola, who was a refugee from Uganda, had to be put at the theological school to study. And her encounters as a student were very uh, 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 challenging. She talks about isolation. She talks about a harassment by the men whom she studied with. My studies around the Quakers also talk about a woman by the name Rasoa Mutua, who joins Bible College in 1943. She had been widowed and was working as a matron of a school, but she wanted to study theology. She was accepted into a class and went through the same curriculum with the men. These men later became the leaders of the church when the missionaries finished their work and left. But for her, she remained on the margins, sometimes preaching only to the women. And later she took up a prison ministry. After Aswa Mutua finished in 1945, the school did not take any women again until in 1978. So women in mission, women in theological education, women in ordained ministry, and the relationship between theological education of women and ordination still remains an issue of great interest and contention within the African church. The same issues that are featured in ecumenical theological education of the World Council of Churches. In 2001, the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Theological Education invited women who are leaders of seminaries or theological schools. About 30 women gathered in Bose, and the aim was to network, to, to share experiences on what it means to lead in a theological school. Eight years later, in 2009, just before the Edinburgh Conference of 2010, another conference was held in Bose, and it brought together different women to discuss mission and theological education. This was with the hope of finding a way to have women's voices and perspectives as an integral part of the 2010 uh, conference. The background of this consultation was the recognition of the church's complicity in the domination, domination of a women and nature in the name of mission. The call for this consultation was repentance 
of this kind of complicity, working for the transformation of unjust structures within the church itself, as well as the wider society, and recognition that in mission, we must work in partnership and with the deep respect of all God's creation. The justification for this call was the priceless contribution of women, theological educators, who continue to bring women into the scene of mission and theological education, and many women's networks that continue to support women in their call to be agents of transformation in the world. The women in this conference committed to challenge, challenge churches and theological schools to proclaim and practice the full participation of women and men in the mending of creation, to work towards the eradication of violence against women by involving both women and men to challenge domination and violence and to mentor young people and work together with youth and partners in mission. The consultation's threefold task of recognition of the error of the church in excluding women in theological education and mission call for repentance of that error and commitment to redress the situation coalesces well with Isabel Piri's observation, <clears throat> reflecting on the success of the circle of concerned African women theologians in their work of mission. Piri observed that if indeed the church acknowledged that women, that God gives gifts to both men and women for the common good of the church, then the church needed to transform itself to support in word and action the theological education of both men and women. She further asserted that this kind of acknowledgement required the realization that according to the science of the times, theological education would be no longer seen as training soldiers of Christ to word, to word of heresy, but servants of Christ willing to build a community of women and men. Both conferences that I've discussed about were brought together women who queried their position, both in theological education and mission. After 2010, the literature about women, mission, and theological education changed focus and began to discuss what really happens in theological schools where women go to train. In 2010, a book that I co-authored entitled, If You Have No Voice, Just Sing, Narratives of Women Students in Theological Education, raises many of those challenges that women were still going through. Grace, one of the narrators, notes that she trained for theology but when she went back to her own church, the church could not accept her. All she could do was to lead choruses in the church. She faithfully led choruses every Sunday and through major, major discussions, the church finally agreed to ordain women in 2018. That's the title, if you have no voice, just say. That was a creative way of continuing to show her presence in the church and to show that she's actually called before uh, she was later ordained. Before the Busan Conference of 2013, a global survey was done on theological education and a number of things were brought up. This included financing theological education the gender disparities in theological education. Although it was also seen that the number of women going to into theological education was increasing, the challenge was that theological education was not transformed to accept women's voices in it, but instead theological education was transforming the women The works of trees shows that theological institutions that are expected to, us to transform uh, 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 the thinking and minds of those that go out appeared not to transform them, 
but to justify the status quo of the churches that people were going to serve. Although they had an, uh, uh, an essential role in creating awareness of issues of society, particularly awareness of gender dy dynamics by questioning cultural and religious values so that they promote human dig dignity. It was clear that many of the institutions that research was being done was not doing that. Theological education that engaged <clears throat> deliberately with the gender issues was suspect in many of the theological schools. <clears throat> After theological education, women were still expected to serve in the roles that were private within the churches. <clears throat> Sumba Kwaka observes that women were underrepresented in leadership, even though 70% of the membership within the churches was by women, but in the leadership, they were not. Hence a book that came out that women feel the pews. They are organized in different organizations, but they hardly take on uh, leadership positions. A survey done by NET Act among theological schools in Sub-Saharan Africa showed that there was an increase of women in theological education as students, but there was not an increase of women as leaders of the churches. It is against this context, therefore, that I talk about the two motifs of groaning and hope from the Easter stories of women who went to the tomb early in the morning asking themselves, who will remove the stone from the tomb, Mark 16, 1 and 7. And the mouse walk of Luke 24, 13 to 32. This is to show the contemporary challenges in access of theological education and participation in, in, in mission as faced by women and show how women are navigating through these challenges. The motif of groaning seeks to demonstrate that although the status <clears throat> and role of women society and in church is advancing in many contexts, it is true that it is not yet very visible. As Matthew Duyoye later notes, that as long as men, especially white men, and others continue to write about theological education, African women will be treated as though they were dead. The motive of hope seeks to show ways through which African women have continued to challenge those terrains that have excluded them in creative and asserting ways. The women who asked who will roll the stone away are women who had followed Jesus closely until his death and burial. They woke up early in the morning to go and treat the body as it was for custom. But on their way, they were wondering who will move the stone away from the grave. When they arrived, they meet a young man sitting alone dressed in white. And they were wondering who is this stranger the stranger spoke to them, noted that they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but he was no longer there. He had gone before them as the stranger told them. The women, women were too overwhelmed to think and they were so afraid to grasp even what they were being told. The stranger told them that Jesus had gone ahead of them and they would go and tell the disciples what had happened. The women left the tomb and went and told the disciples as they had been told. The two men who were walking on the mouse road 
uh, Luke 24, 13 to 32. The reason Christ became a companion with them. They were groaning, they were in the verge of despair. Jesus entered into a dialogue with them. He listened to their stories, their visions, and how their hopes had been shattered. Gerald West offers seven steps in terms of this dialogue. And this dialogue offers some ways in which women have had to work around theological education and mission. The steps include the recognition of the culture of silence that seemed to surround the disciples and so many of the marginalized even today. It then shifted to the role of Jesus or the contemporary facilitator who draws near them, walks with them, listens to them and asks questions, establishing trust, equalizing powers of relation and enters into a dialogue process of speaking with. The third step, Gerald says, emphasizes the disciples' knowledge, their own analysis of reality, taking the knowledge, especially of the poor within our societies as a ground of conversation. And the fourth step is to recognize the role of Jesus as a popular educator who engages in a rereading of the scripture together with the disciples, adopting a pedagogical posture that interrogates both the received scriptural tradition and the understanding of the realities. Finally, he talks about the importance of both dialogue and collaboration. These ways that Gerald West discusses the Emmaus rule are ways in which women, African women, have used the Easter stories to speak about their situation in theological education and in mission. So therefore, through this kind of shared praxis approach and the motif of groaning and hope, one uses it as a hermeneutic, sorry, as a hermeneutic, hermeneutical lens from self-isolation from church theologies, from self-preservation of the churches, and the public theologies of self-opposition. This approach produces, therefore, an ecumenical, inclusive, diversified, and contextualized theological education, specifically targeting the women and the youth within the African context. So how? have African women used this motif of who will roll the stone away for us. Masi Amba Oduyoye actually has authored a book and the title is Who Will Roll the Stone Away for Us. Doing Bible studies in 1987 at the World Council of Churches, women church and society, she discusses the stones that are ahead of women as they try to study theology and as they try to do mission. She says, the imagery of stones as stumbling blocks, hampering women's lives is a fertile ground for discussion. The stream of resurrection people that has flowed from the empty tomb has continued to broaden and deepen. The story of the two who walked with the risen Christ towards a mouse without recognizing him is also helpful as we plan our journey that would take years. She wrote this book when she prepared for the ecumenical decade of the church in solidarity with women. For Duyoye, the Easter story proved to be a springboard for uncovering the stones of oppression in the form of sexism, 
racism, classism, and exclusion of women from full participation in the church and in the wider society. The story not only aided her in naming various trends of oppression towards women, it also revealed visions of hope and transformation, partnership and cooperation, not only for oppressed women, but for the entire faith community. Uduoye emphasized most critically that the decade for the ecumenical, for the church in solidarity with women would guide and illuminate the path towards women's empowerment and transformation. Of course, in 1988, the ecumenical decade of churches in solidarity with women was formed, set up by the World Council of Churches. It was aimed at empowering women to challenge oppressive structures in the global community. There are churches and communities to affirm through shared leadership and decision-making, theology and spirituality, the decisive contributions of women in the church and communities, and to give visibility to the women's perspectives and actions. The churches in Africa declared their solidarity with women in observing the decade of the churches in solidarity with women, some churches widened their scope in relation to the liberation of women. Throughout the decade, women and some men challenged churches to move beyond patriarchal structures and practices that devalue the gifts, contributions, and the very presence of women while excluding them from leading leadership roles and decision-making opportunities. Udio in particular believed that churches should be in solidarity with women because this was what the church was called for. Standing in solidarity with women, the churches were identifying themselves with the truth and justice and embracing the whole humanity as a single unity in God's creation. For African women themselves, what has supported and encouraged them in relation to the mission and theological education was the creation of the circle of concerned African women theologians. This was formed in 1989 under the leadership of Masi Amba Oduye. It is an ecumenical and interfaith body of African women theologians. The circle used the story of Jesus raising Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead, emphasizing the words Talitha Kumi as a source of inspiration. As in the story, Jesus took Jairus' daughter by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, or little girl, get up. African women needed to wake up so that they could tell their story and they could find ways of taking center stage within the church. If they didn't, as I noted earlier, Oduoye observed that they would be treated as though they were dead. The African women's first encounter or dialogue was to write a book, Groaning in Faith, Women in the Household of Faith. The circle of concerned African women theologians in cognizance of the dearth of information on theological uh, education and particularly on women. Focused on addressing this dearth of writings by women writing on women, religion, and culture. They observed that while women were dominant members in the religious gatherings and cultural practices, there was hardly material that one would read from their perspectives. While it is true that there were some that had become leaders in various capacities, including leaders in seminaries and theological colleges. A lot of the writings that was being used was by men 
and from the perspectives of men. So male generated interrupt inter in interpretations of culture and scriptures were often used to oppress, exploit, and keep women in their cultural religiously designated space. So the first book, Groaning in Faith, African Women in the Household of God, they observed that in deep pain of exclusion, domination, and marginalization, we have heard the voices of wise women urging us to speak out and tell our stories of which we alone hold the copyright. We have decided to undertake this task in the faith and hope that others will listen and join us in the continuing encounters with our creator and brothers and sisters as we seek to empower one another and eradicate all forms of oppression. We clarify values and practices within the African cultural and religious milieu, which order our daily lives. We also cite the scriptures to design how they have been interpreted to shape our lives and to, to seek what difference it makes when those same scriptures are reread and reinterpreted through the eyes of women who, who for years have longed for liberation. By telling our stories and articulating them theologically, we are insisting on our right to be engaged together with our male theologians and the leaders of our religion in the task of reconstructing the African continent dialogue, which must begin at home. It must take place within the home, within the worship spaces and within the society. We must take part in taking, in making decisions about our lives and the lives of other sisters. They conclude by saying, this is uh, the reason we have gathered and recorded our thoughts and reflections in this book, Groaning in Faith, lest anybody claims that they do not exist. We are aware of our many limitations. Nevertheless, we are determined to continue groaning in faith while we are aware that dawn of new life is near. So the aim of the circle was to empower lay and ordained women to study and write theology, which would impact the churches as they read them. So the initial focus was to address the dearth of writings by African women on religion and culture. Today, one can say that there are hundreds of books and dissertations published by the Sako women, and they address all aspects of religion and culture and its impact on women in Africa. The fifth conference that took place in 2019 celebrated 30 years, and the theme was focusing on environment and climate change from my gendered and African woman's perspectives. Because the themes, are many that are written by these women from the Bible, the culture, interfaith issues, health and healing, pandemics such as HIV and now COVID. Through these publications, as one way of navigating the spaces that are normally dominated by men, the circle members bring to the fore the contextual realities of both the continent and particularly those that have impacted on women. The publications name the complex realities of women, including, of course, historically colonialism, neocolonialism, aspects of conflict and war, aspect of health and healing. The publications analyze the community in which the African women live and work and the context in which their lives are, are intertwined. The survival of the African women is intricately connected with her community as its survival is dependent on her. The women note that they are responsible for providing shelter, food and care for all and spiritual guidance even within their community. Through the writings, the publications, 
the members have worked hard in dealing with the stones that bar women from accessing theological education. As well as writing and producing information about women, education, and service. The second aspect that the SACO has been involved in is the question of engendering theological education. If theological education is in preparation for leadership, then the story must be told by both men and women rather than men alone. While the stories differ from one church to another, it is true that the experiences of women are similar. In regards to writing, what the women have done for theological education and mission is to bring to the fore the engendering of epistemologies. If epistemology is intricately linked with research methods and methodology, then as Sarojin Nadar has argued that women's research, particularly where narrative research methods are applied and the processes, then the processes of research is as important as the product of the research and the identity of the researcher. Other women theologians underscore the need for gendering knowledge in order to facilitate and cover marginal and marginalized narratives. The multiple marginalization of women is explicitly highlighted in post-colonial feminist studies, both the oppressions by patriarchy as well as by empire, as Musa Dube uh, observes. Her pioneering work in articulating feminist post-colonial theology in the African context brings to light the voices of women, especially in the field of biblical hermeneutics. So when Sarojin Nadar says that narratives are data with a soul, it is acknowledging that the life stories of these women are a source of theological reflection. And this, of course, leads to critiquing the hegemonic research approaches that have been there before. And then at the same time, it engenders the sources of knowledge. So women engender theology so that it is not something that is received or handed over, but that which we struggle with every day as Oduyo observes. On the question, who is Jesus? Therefore, women theologians have had to look into the gospels to discover Jesus. And as Nasimiyu observes, the gospels bring out human dignity because the parables of Jesus concern for women and their well-being are many and the restoration of their true worth and dignity in all spheres. In suffering, Christ took on the conditions of the African woman and the conditions of the whole humanity. And in his resurrection, they argue, the African woman is called to participate in the restoration of harmony, equality, and inclusiveness in all human relationships. And that is a mission that she's called to do. In writing, in terms of discovering who Jesus is, from the Gospels, the women observe that Jesus protects, Jesus gives life and nurtures, displaying the leg legitimatization of the stereotypical female virtues in his own life, clearly lived and well-defined. So both men and women are called 
to exhibit the qualities of a mother and to follow this lifestyle of loving to a neighbor, putting others first and giving life. So in terms of mission, therefore, the circle shows that women are full participants in the life of the church, restoring church and humanity to the initial inclusive, holistic and mutual relationships between women and men. So both men and women, they argue, are called to give birth to new and better human relationships as observed by Nasimi Wasike. So through writing and bringing to light these aspects that have not been brought to light, women theologians have worked towards engendering the whole theological education. And in terms of engendering this theological education, theologians have provided a method and approach which takes seriously the context within which the church operates in the continent. And in engendering theological education, first of course was to provide the theological material from the perspectives of women. And two, it was to redefine the processes of theology and encourage women to study this theology rather than it being a preserve of men. It is through engendering theological education that women had to challenge the link between the study of theology and ordination. Because the study of theology and ordination, when it was linked, it meant that women, the churches that never ordained women, women would not be allowed to study theology. Hence, delinking theological education and ordination and making theology as a study for the people of God. And that opened up ways in which women could come in and bring their experiences of church life into the theological space. So as well as opening up theology for the people of God, one discovers that women came from different churches, including African independent churches. That today we have theologically trained women who have taken on leadership both within the mainline churches and some of the independent churches. The writings that women brought out in terms of theology had to impact on the curriculum. And so the other process of engendering theological education was to do with the curriculum in terms of its structure and content so that it was open to prepare both men and women for the ministry of the church and for the mission of the church. Now, engendering the curriculum was not just adding one unit there and one unit there about women. It meant providing ways to clarify theological vision, to reformulate theology and offer a theological curriculum, which was both relevant, life affirming for both men and women. The process among other things was to lead to a continuous examining and re-examining of policies, structures and organizational dynamics where the training has to take place. And this process, as women would say, is not a once for all, a once, a one thing that you just tick the box. It is one, a process that continues in terms of the way society is changing and the dynamics that society brings to the church. The most important thing in engendering the curriculum was to assess 
the power analysis and the social dynamics around the teaching of theology. It meant critiquing the cultural and contextual chauvinisms in the areas of curriculum. Engendering the curriculum meant also, or was also to ensure that the de delivery of theological information acknowledged the presence of women, not only as objects of study, but as participants in the study. Theological education therefore was not to make women men or men women. It was to, to use the lived experiences of both men and women, and particularly women who had been excluded for a long time in the theological discourse. So the thinking of both men and women is challenged, hence looking at new ways of being church wherever they are. In this discussion, therefore, what I have attempted to do so that we can um, uh, uh, discuss is, of course, as I said earlier, is to look <clears throat> what I have attempted to do <clears throat> in this, uh, just a minute. I'm just <clears throat> looking for my conclusion. <clears throat> so in this paper, through an African women's perspective, I've sought to recapitulate and recast the women's aspirations in theological education as individuals uh, through and, 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 and groups through the different conferences. I've told the story of women engaging in theological education. The two World Council of Churches that I mentioned, the ecumenical decade of uh, the church in solidarity with women. So whereas the consultations affirmed the imperative that since both men and women are made in the image of God and therefore should both be present, working side by side in mission. The conferences have said sounded alarm for the future. The women, as I've showed, have expressed uh, have expressed great concern about theological education. I have shown the ways in which the circle of concerned African women theology, theology, theologians have navigated the spaces and found their way into the center. So through the motifs of groaning and motifs of hope from the Eastern narratives, it is clear that men and women are called for God's service, but there are stones that need to be dealt with. Stones that cover the spaces where women should work. I've shown therefore how the women have managed to navigate those stones. Hence today, there are many in leadership. But one downside to that that I want to conclude with is the fact that although the women have produced lots of literature that can be used within theological study. If you went to my library today, you'll find very little of those of, of the books in the shelves. And the reasons for that are of course, historical, they are financial, and there is still a bias among many 
among some of the African scholars, a bias against theology written from women's perspectives. Some of them, in fact, joke that that is not real theology. Those are stories. But I conclude by saying that as Christians, we are consumers of stories. And the best story is the story of Easter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Momo, an excellent, excellent uh, address. And as a narrative theologian myself, I think that is the best way to, uh, to go forward is tell good stories because stories uh, change the church and change people and then change lives. So, so thank you so much. Um, on your, for those who want to um, ask a question or make a comment, if you look at your Zoom screen down at the bottom right, there is a button called reactions. And if you push that button and go up, it says raise hand, which I just did. You see what that hand looks like on there? Um, uh, and if you have a question and if you're here and you want to ask a question, you can say that and, and, and Damon will um, go around with that. Um, let me just ask a quick question just to start things off, um, Esther. Um, do you see the church at the forefront of women's involvement in giving voice to wider society, or are they catching up with um, voices within society outside the church? Is, is, is the church a leader in this, or is it a follower within the African setting? Uh, critically, I would say none of the above. It's not a leader and it's not a follower. It's not a leader because it is caught by surprise. And I hear even today uh, uh, senior leadership saying that the church is not for affirmative action. Uh, I was trying to look at how many women were admitted into the theological study. And some of the very significant theological schools in Africa, I was surprised to hear that last year, only one woman was admitted to theological school. Mm. So I would say it's none. I think that it is still in limbo, it's really struggling. And, and of course that is generalizing. There could be those that have gone ahead. But generally I would say that um, the society pushes the church to rethink rather than the church pushing the society to rethink. The church is sometimes is not a good example on the leadership of, of women or, or empowering women's leadership. And if I take my country, I wouldn't say for every other country, but if I take for my own, my own country, of course you say, but now you have bishops. Just the Anglican church has, 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 two, has two bishops, one an assistant bishop and one a, a, a bishop of a, of a diocese. But that is a drop in the ocean. Uh, I think, the church has uh, an opportunity to do more, but I don't see it. If you ask me how many students came to the theological, my theological classes at St. Paul's, uh, there are classes that perhaps you'll find one woman or two women. So the women are maybe 20%. There was a time they were 60%, but we see now them becoming less and less. So that's the way, that's the way I would answer that and the examples I've given, thank you. Okay. Um, Marina, you had your hand raised. Do you have a, a comment or a question? Uh, Esther, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I mean, like, I'm just thinking about, you know, when we look at the theme, theological education and missional formation, in most cases, people who do theological education, it's often understood to be a training for ministerial formation. So there are churches and contexts where uh, a woman cannot be ordained. You don't ordain women. So when we look at uh, theological, or theological or education and not, not as for ordination and ministerial formation, but as missional formation, what are the scope that would be there in, the con in your context that you, the context you're looking at for missional formation, where will you find space for women to make use or contribute what they have learned through theological education? 
uh, there are many women who have done theological studies and have not, do not have callers. They are not ordained. I'm one of those. They are not ordained. Uh, those women are, some of them are serving in actually secular society, secular species. I know a lay woman who was not ordained, but now runs a school. And in that school, she's brought in uh, uh, Muslim and Christian uh, children. And she has a great mission uh, in uh, supporting and helping girls from a Muslim context. So I see them in education, in other forms of education that they found, find their ways there and offer service. I see uh, a lot of them now who go into chaplaincy. And so they use uh, their studies in providing support uh, for those that are ailing in society, either chaplaincy in the hospitals or chaplaincy in schools. And I do know churches that do not ordain, uh, they would just push them into, into those spaces. So I see them in, in health, I see them in development, I see them in education, a number of them that offer or use their giftings in those spaces. John Padward, go ahead. So, so for them, the, the, the world is the parish. So they are not confined into just one local community. But if they are serving in, in the hospital, they're serving everybody. If they are serving in a school, they're serving everybody. Those that have no calling for ordination, that is good. But those that feel called for ordination and then they are denied, I think for me, that is a sad reality. Okay, John Pavlik, if you will unmute and ask your question. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Esther. Uh, it was very moving. And I am aware that you are reflecting on a life of work in this area and struggle in this area. And it comes through in the way you have presented this paper. Um, I'm also, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased in a way that you brought Gerald West in um, in his analysis, I think, of power relations and how to deconstruct um, power structures to liberate the voices of those who are not heard. I, I just wonder whether you have a, the reference there that you were referring to. Um, yes, it is. Um, sorry. I can just get it for you. I, I have it. Uh, uh, if I can get the, the page, yes, I'll get it for you. It is the one that he has done something about the poor, reading the Bible with the poor. Okay. I'll just give it to you now. If I can find the page. Well, just, just the, the, the book itself will be enough, I think. Yes, I'll get the book. I'll just get the book. Yeah. Okay, I'll get it for you. Okay. We can go and I'll get the book for you. I'm just looking for the page where it, or maybe it is here. Yeah. Okay. I'll get the page for you. Just go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll get that link for you. Yeah. Um, and because it's it, this is a the 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 the, the problems faced by women, it's a, is a kind of epitome, really, um, of the nature of power struggles um, and in society. I just wanted to underline what you said towards the end that the struggle it doesn't is never over because no. power reconstructs itself continually. Um, it might, I suppose it's part of human nature to oppress others without, and justifying it in such a way that we don't feel it if we're in the power. We just, we just act out 
in what we consider to be our righteousness. <laughs> um, that's just a reflection, really. I, I wondered if you could say something a little bit ab about your involvement with um, Muslims in this process, uh, Muslim women. You did mention a, a Muslim woman at, towards the end and uh, working, um, I can't remember, working in a, in a school setting, was it? I can't remember. Yeah, it is. It, you know, she, she's a Christian, but who supports uh, students, uh, a lot of them from a Muslim uh, context. I, I'll get you the book uh, later. But um, the, the Sack of Concerned African Women Theologians uh, brings together both Muslim theologians and Christian uh, theologians. Uh, some of these Muslim theologians are those that are uh, working within the departments of religion and philosophy and do teach religion in those spaces. And, 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 and working with them, uh, dialoguing to just find where, where, where they are you do discover that there is a, a lot of commonalities with the ways in which uh, the, the, the interpretations of their own Quranic texts about women and who interprets them. While you have uh, women like um, uh, Rabiatu from Ghana, who reads and writes from uh, a liberative uh, expression in terms of women and the Quran, you do find that there are very few who can read it that way. Just like within the Christian, the people who have the power to read and interpret the text are, uh, uh, are men. And uh, very few of those uh, have a liberative approach like uh, Gerald West and others. So in terms of dialogue, of course, we do share a great deal commonalities and we do share ways in which uh, 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 you navigate uh, uh, the spaces. I know, for example, uh, uh, a Muslim male scholar who uh, continues to unravel uh, 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 women preachers within the Islamic context. But he looks at, he, he's more from a liberative uh, perspective than those that um, practice what they would call the cultural Islam. Just like people say, Islam may say this, but the culture uh, is used to interpret it in particular localities. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, is it Mikael? Do you have a question? Yeah. Thank you, um, Esther, for this really intriguing lecture and uh, the story that you bring out from the African soil. And I would like to uh, think along in, in two ways. The one is, um, I love stories, and I think uh, doing kind of narrative theology is really good, and it adds up to the question in the sense of, um, what would it mean in teaching how to confront people to also to change their perspective? Because I think on the one hand, in education, we have to leave it open, whether people accept what we want to teach them, Okay, and on the other hand, um, you are making a strong case that the stories told are stories of real life, so that people need to engage with the fact that there are persons who are telling these as their stories. And I think that's a little bit of a gap, maybe, or let me put it that way, as a difference. As an example, um, we have in, in Germany, uh, in our context, a big discussion about inclusive language. You know, there are some who say, only in an inclusive language myself, as a speaker, I'm visible. And because the language is in a way not really uncovering my gender, my disability, uh, the way I think, um, the way I identify myself. And there are others who are saying, it makes life so complicated and everybody wants to be seen. How can we do that? It's atrocious and you know, and you have all this different marks in the language, in the written language where people say, the text becomes unreadable. And I think this discussion about identity to be seen, who has the right to speak, who has also the right to challenge others to be heard, and on the other hand, somehow finding a way where you cannot impose the perspectives in teaching on others. I think there, there is a conflict and how to deal with that. Do you have an idea from your long, probably also sometimes painful experience in teaching men or even maybe sometimes women about a specific women's perspective. 
Thank you. Part of it is what John was saying. Uh, it has to do with, with power. Uh, there was a time I felt that, for example, in the theological education in my own institution, we had made lots of strides forward. We had uh, many uh, women studying theology. We had up to like 70% of uh, were women. And I felt right. Now we are uh, uh, going forward. But of course, this is not isolated. It is in the context of the world. And so what I've discovered now is that there's a, like a backlash where the old models are coming in. And um, for lack of a better word, when you, you, people say we want to be doctrinally right, we want to be uh, Christocentered, we want to be, we want, when you begin to hear that language, you, you do know that there is a power play in terms of identity, who do we want to align with? Uh, uh, and why are we aligning with, with the other? But much more so, it's the question of, for some, a refusal to, to think, to envision even where they are, a refusal to see. I say sometimes when you are in a position of power, you have to really work hard to see from the other side. And so I speak today wondering what has gone wrong. I thought we were moving forward. It seems either to be stagnant or we, we are going backward. Why are we going backward? But I do realize that you can look at the country, you can look at the continent and you can look at the world and discover that the, the forward looking is not the most popular. <laughs> It's either the stagnant or the backward looking that, that, that is popular. And especially in relation to the place of place of women and particularly in the religious uh, fields. Mm -hmm. Israel, go ahead and uh, unmute and ask your question. Um, hello, Esther, Humbo. thank you very much. I'm a Peruvian living in Norway. So I know a lot about what you was saying about the, the struggles of women, Christian women and in, in the churches. And, and just to, 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 make, to give you an example, I was um, four or five months ago in Peru in a, in a, in a big gathering, in an assembly, and there were uh, pastors that were uh, uh, pastors' wives, and there were some missionaries and uh, Christian workers, women. And the main speaker uh, or the main, the main uh, leader of the conference was addressing all the time to pastors. Uh, uh, welcome to the pastors. And, and when he was <laughs> and, uh, explaining something, is he was addressing to listen to me, pastors. And, and I thought, well, here there are many women uh, who are not pastors. Uh, so they were invisible as, as, as you were saying, uh, uh, telling about uh, what the struggles you are working with, which is very real and it's very painful as it was said before. And uh, be because of the issue of gender, of being a woman, be relegated to just be a, a follower, never being a relevant person and, uh, within the church uh, and the church movements uh, in theological education. But uh, I, I, uh, I was thinking when you were talking about your uh, frame of the issue, uh, I, I realized you were using uh, a lot of uh, post-colonial theory uh, in, in your appreciation as a main tool. I wonder if that is correct, but you use uh, many words like center and periphery, and power and uh, the marginalized, and, uh, and, and uh, dominance, hegemony, and uh, lack, uh, lack of inclusion. So those are terminologies within, within the post-colonial theory. And, uh, I was, uh, and also you mentioned something about hermeneutics, the, the, the big struggle in it within the church to, to open the way for women in theological education. And I was 
thinking as I listen to you that much of the power um, issue within the church to, to submit women in the way to, to keep them low, uh, it has to do a lot with the uh, uh, way of using hermeneutics because within the church in many of the Latin American environments and maybe African too, the use of the Bible is very strong. It, it's a, it is a tool to, to, to strengthen this kind of dominance of a woman. How do you think uh, we could deal with that uh, way of hermeneutical epistem epistemology to overcome this uh, distance? Thank you. Uh, John, the, the book is the uh, Bible and the poor, and it is in one of the Regnum uh, books, uh, volume 18. Thank you. Bible and Mission, volume 18. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yes, uh, the, the African women, I would say, are under a triple, a triple patriarchy. That is the African patriarchy itself that emanates from African culture. Uh, and as you see, the circle of concerned African women theologians, the first thing they had to look at was to interrogate African culture. While there are others who just accepted African culture is our culture because of the missionary onslaught on the culture. The African women said, no, we will critically look at our, our culture and see what is affirming in our culture and what is destructive. And so began to do away or challenge the aspects within African culture that were destructive and look for those that were affirming and have continued to, to, to work uh, with that. That's one. And then uh, the second patriarchy is the uh, Christian missionary patriarchy. Uh, and that is uh, within colonial uh, imperialism. And that you find that. And that has not ended. Uh, I would look at the churches and say they are still very colonial churches. What is, uh, or what is indigenous or what is African is on the periphery, the, the center is actually still a very colonial church. And the third is the colonial uh, patriarchy itself. And so for women to deal with those three patriarchies, one had to look for a language that uh, 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 gives them power to, to name the problem and to look for the, the, the answer to the problem. So part of the hermeneutics uh, is the ways in which uh, hermeneutics are still taught. So if you are looking at the works of Gerald West, uh, for example, uh, the works of Musa Dube, for example, those uh, 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 critique empire, critique uh, uh, patriarchy, critique. But when you think of who is teaching these African uh, uh, pastors in my context, you discover some of them are those that perhaps fear to interrogate using post-colonial language. So they'll say post-colonialism is heresy, it's not, it's not doctrinal or something like that. And in theological spaces, especially where I teach, the lecturers have a lot of power over students. At the same time, the students not only just listen to the lecturers, they see their leaders, the church leaders, which, which church leader is respected, and they copy that. And so in terms of looking at hermeneutics, uh, one has to uh, look at hermeneutics from below. Uh, 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 as I think Steve Biko says, don't use the gun of your enemy. It may not have the, the powder or something like that. And Bio uh, Yemasi uh, says, I will use this Bible, but I will use it uh, uh, differently. I'll go to those spaces that affirm the weak, those spaces where the weak are brought to light. And so it's the teaching of hermeneutics and the books that are written about hermeneutics. And as I was saying, that when you come to some of our theological schools, it is those books that we continue to get sometimes from the West that are free 
and that have not woken up to, <laughs> to the changes in the world. And that's the, that's the ones you get a lot in our libraries. Books that are uh, more liberating in the ways they are, you don't, you don't get them. So there is a lot about who teaches, how they teaches and where they teach. And so because women are fewer in theological seminaries in, in teaching, they are drowned, you know. So uh, it is, how do you hold those tensions? And I know there are women who are working hard to change their amenities. And there are men also who are doing that, but it is a slow, is a slow process. But there are men who are, Gerald West, for example, the way he, he brings to light uh, issues of empire and, 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 uh, and, and patriarchy, or Musa and others. So for me, the question is how, how you teach. Uh, and as I was saying, revisioning the curriculum. And curriculum is a powerful tool. And who, who writes it and how they write it is like, who has the power? And so you, you go ahead and revision it in one, revise it in one way, and then you find somebody else is revising it on the other in the other way. But I think for me is like to be optimistic and continue to, to do the right thing by critiquing, challenging, and offering new ways of reading texts to the to, to, to the community. Okay, we have a question here and there'll be Kunle, please. I'm gonna turn the light your way. Oh, come up here, Kunle, and ask from the front mic. Which microphone is it? He's getting used to it. He's getting used to it. Go ahead, Kunle. Okay. Let's just use this. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot of things from some of the insight provided on the groodings of women. Uh, I happen to be in Kenya between 2010 and 2013 as a student in NEXT, AIU. And I attended so many conferences, lectures, and at the same time participated in regular churches like AIC, Nairobi Pentecostal churches, Sitam, Deliverance churches in Heldoret, Mombasa, Machakos, and also in Nairobi Central. In my class at that time, where I studied, there seemed to be more women in the classrooms along with us. And again, we also have some of the tutors, women like Dr. Uh, Mutuku Chesi, Dr. Shoge, some of them were trained in America by the Fullers in Fuller Seminary. But I discovered that most of the churches, you said the purpose of theology is to equip and empower, especially women. But in some of these churches, we have not seen women being practically ordained for ministry, especially maybe in uh, some of the older churches like AIC, SITAM, and MPC. And when you look at Scott, St. Paul, where you are, AIU, Kabarak, and also some Presbyterian churches, we discover that more women at the lower level, they come to the ministry, but they are not at the top. What could we do in such situation, especially in the context of developing African women for practical engagement? in the public? That's just the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> that is, uh, that is, that is big. And I'm wondering why did you leave to uh, Oxford? If you are in Oxford, you should have um, stayed with us. You are more Kenyan than, <laughs> than being in Oxford. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the observation you have made is very true. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just to sidetrack, I was invited to speak at a graduation ceremony in um, AIU. And uh, when I arrived uh, before the, the, the hour of graduation, a lecturer uh, uh, confronted me and said, I should know 
they are evangelical and uh, because I come from a liberal school and I should know, I should remain within the text of scripture that they had given me. I was very surprised uh, because I was invited as a commencement speaker and um, I had been given a theme, but he was concerned that I should remain within that theme. So I went ahead and gave my graduation. I did say to him that the graduates are not just going to evangelical spaces, they'll be going to different spaces in the country. They are going to be serving different spaces. So I would address the graduates and the way I see uh, the context. So I was taken aback, but I gave my, my lecture and I finished. And he came back to me and he said, thank you very much. First, he praised me for uh, keeping time. <laughs> So you can tell where he came from. And second, he, he, he thanked me for remaining in the, uh, 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 in the theme. Right? The churches that you have mentioned uh, historically have, never, have not, uh, AIC, for example, which is a, a traditional, uh, a, a mainline church in this country that goes back uh, to years ago that other, other mission churches, uh, other missionary founded churches began has uh, never had a tradition of ordaining women. They've allowed them to study. Most of their colleges, the women will study, but they will have other ministries in the church other than uh, being ordained. Or if they are ordained pastors, I do know some that are ordained pastors, they will be working under uh, uh, pastors that are men. I've also experienced women within NPC, CTAM, and deliverance churches that are very frustrated in the ways in which they are treated. Uh, uh, some, of course, find ways out, others uh, stay, others are convinced that that is the way things should be. The fact that they are not uh, raising, it doesn't mean that all of them have accepted it, that there are questions uh, uh, that they question, but uh, even when you think of Anglicans or Presbyterians, the process of ordination is a long process. I do know in one house it took 20 years to talk about it before women were finally doing it. So maybe there haven't been groups in those churches that have called for the ordination. But again, we go back to the ways in which the Bible is read and interpreted in those uh, spaces and what they think about us. And I do know women from those churches that seek uh, uh, to, 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 to work in spaces like that powers. So it's just the ways in which uh, uh, the Bible is read that it is interpreted and who has, who, who talks about the authority of scripture and the way the authority of scripture is taken on. I do know that uh, I attend meetings with some of the women from these churches and uh, we discuss texts and we discuss how texts are used uh, in terms of exclusion and uh, marginalization. Uh, but um, yes, who will roll away the stones? I think for SACO members that, that there's a big stone there is who will roll it away uh, 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 so that the, 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 the women have a, a, an opportunity to serve in the, in the same way. Because the silence doesn't mean that they are happy. Uh, uh, and the women there will not say it will never, they'll just say they'll continue to be hopeful that it will happen one day. And maybe through men like you, uh, if you have the conviction, then uh, one uh, I would work towards that kind of liberation. Because I do think that this work of inclusion of women is not a women's affair. It is a church affair, it is an affair for all of us who are called to this ministry who read uh, 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 the text. And the text is not about exclusion, it is about inclusion. So it's the work for all of us. So it is a ministry. Mm -hmm. We're just about done for time, but we're gonna have David So come and ask the last question. Um, thank you for your lecture, Esther. I think we met briefly around about 2010 in your university when mm -hmm. I went to uh, see your principal then, Professor Gilgalo. We just had a very brief meeting then. Um, your, your lecture reminded me of three groups of uh, women. First group is the, the women in the gospel story. 
where we see Jesus uh, treating the women in a revolutionary way compared to the way of the culture at the time. Jesus respected them. Jesus taught them. You know, in those days, it's not even worthy to teach. <laughs> Jesus taught them. Jesus healed them, delivered them, and he was supported by them. It's absolutely revolutionary. So that's one, you know, group. The second group is that uh, I, I'm reminded about my mother and my daughter. My, my mother uh, grew up in a farming family, and he, she had two younger brothers. But because of that, because she, she was female, she was not educated. Her two brothers were, and they became quite well educated. It's, it's clearly, the, there's a gender bias. Although I guess my, 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 my mother was pretty bright, she told me at least. But she had no, no education opportunity. That's, that's remind me of the culture, you know, that, 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 that was the culture in Jesus' day. That was the culture in my mother's day. And probably that's also the culture in, in, in much many African countries. And that remind me of the third group of uh, uh, women. That is, at OCMS, we had a number of PhD graduates in Africa. I think at least in Kenya, we had three. We have three. One is Emily, I can't pronounce her name correctly, but forgive me if I pronounce wrong. Emily Onyango. Yes. Second one is uh, Beatrice Mbongo. Mbongo. And Beatrice Mbongo. The third yes. one is Catherine. Kat I can't remember her surname. She's an SDA leader. Catherine, starting with N, 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 N Yamo, something like that. Sorry, I, I'm not really good at pronouncing it. So we have three. A uh, PhD graduate, a female graduate in Kenya. One also, one in Zambia, one in Zimbabwe. So this group of students reminds me, and, and yourself. So this group of people represent the anomalies. You managed to break through. The cultural barrier is so hard. So hard. I, I can see that from, from the cultural point of view. But there are some anomalies who have broken through the barriers. So is it worth studying this, the, 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 this number of anomalies and see how, how come they manage to break through and in some way replicate the story in some way to facilitate this and so that there could be more breakthroughs so there could be more PhD graduates who can write books for the curriculum in the theological seminary and so that they, their voices get heard by the theological students and people say, okay, the lecturers, the, 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 the writers are females, I can, I can go to the college and study theology. Or even better, you can send more students to OCMS to get their doctorate. <laughs> so, so how do we study some of these anomalies and learn from them and maybe propagate this, this, this idea of you know, female scholars more? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emily. Uh, Dr. Emily is my colleague, and uh, she's now the she was the first woman to be made an assistant uh, bishop. She was the second one to be ordained uh, uh, in the Anglican Church in Kenya, and so yeah, she's managed to go through those ranks. And it's not a joyous experience; it's a painful experience. But but she served uh, there, and even if you wrote about each one of them, you'll discover the challenges that, that they are, uh, 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 where they are. The fact that you even call them anomalies is problematic. Sure. Uh, why an anomaly? It's a normal thing to study <laughs> and have a PhD. So it's not, a, for me, it's not an anomaly. It's anomaly because we've made it that way. It's like the space is for men. And, and so the women who come there, they, they, they have to be welcomed. It's like, uh, uh, when uh, Emily was to be consecrated bishop, and some people are saying, oh, our daughter is coming to, to be bishop. And some of the people calling her daughter were people that she had already taught at a theological school. So that, that, the fact that it is seen as an anomaly for me is problematic. It should be seen as normal. Uh, that the men, women can, can, can study and it's a normal, a normal thing to, to do. I didn't speak about the financial constraints of theological education. 
uh, I'm sure if you provided finances, we may have study. But financial invest, uh, theological education is an investment for the church. And in my book, if you have no uh, uh, voice just saying, you have women talking about the financial constraints and you have churches that refuse to invest in women, especially if they are single, because if they invest in this woman, she may be married to another church. So they don't see her as going there as a missionary. They see her as she's, 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 they've lost. And, and those kind of dynamics do not help younger women to, to study or single women to be to, to study. Sometimes if they're married women, the, the challenges within family to, to study. So we need to correct those anomalies <laughs> of, 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 fight, of investing that you said that your mother, the brother, they invested in their brothers and not her. The churches invest in men, they don't invest, invest in women. And, and when you think of single women will have their stories, single mothers will have their stories, widows will have their stories. So this status of women at the church needs to open up and see them as normal rather than seeing them as the old ones out. So the, the, there's a sense in which the church, the, the church leadership, the teaching, the perceptions need to change so that we don't have these anomalies. We just have people studying uh, at theology. And that is what I've been working for and I continue to, 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 to work for. Ask churches to invest in women rather than seeing them as single, as married, as widowed, or as single mothers. In fact, single mothers, uh, it's very hard even to find an opportunity to go and study. But single fathers, which we don't have many, <laughs> or they never come out, they, they, they are always uh, let, let go. Like that. So I think first is the language we need to, to deal with. Uh, and secondly, is to try and invest uh, 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 in, in the women uh, to go and study. Thank you. Well, that's a good summation, um, um, Esther, and we really appreciate it. And that, that's what we need. We need investment so that it's the norm, not the anomaly. And again, thank you so much. Uh, do let anyone know that this um, talk is available through YouTube, uh, which you, uh, the, and the YouTube connection is on our site uh, here at OCMS. And we look forward to more speakers as we go through this series. But again, thank you so much and adieu for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.